Great, yeah, so thank you and thank you to the IS for having me here. And uh, today I'm gonna talk about some connections between total search problems, de-randomization and questions, sort of classic questions and complexity about circuit complexity and time-space trade-offs. So I'll introduce all of these things here, uh, starting with uh, total search problems. So uh, sort of a, a common thing that happens in pretty much area, every area of mathematics uh, is you know you have a proof of some theorem that some type of object exists, but uh, the proof is sort of dissatisfying in the sense that it doesn't seem to give you any indication of like a specific example of this object. And um, you know sometimes we work very hard and we find a more constructive proof, uh, but in a lot of cases it seems like the theorem we're trying to prove like it's almost inherent to this theorem that you could not prove it uh, in a constructive way. And uh, maybe we could conjecture that this is in some formal sense true for a certain theorem, uh, but it's not immediately clear how you could sort of go about defining that. And so uh, there are a couple of ways to sort of approach this problem, but complexity theory offers us one possible approach, which is that we can sort of say almost as a matter of definition that an existence theorem uh, is, can be proven constructively if there's some efficient algorithm that can actually produce examples of the objects which the theorem is proving to exist. Um, and so sort of a specific approach in this realm uh, was pioneered by Papadimitriou uh, in a paper in 1994, where he sort of introduced the systemic study of what's called a total search problems. So a total search problem is a search, so a search problem is in a vague sense, you're given some description of some object, a string, whatever, and you're supposed to find something that's related to it in some way, which we call a solution. And a search problem is total, if every instance has a solution. So maybe it's best to just see an example to understand. Uh, so a classic example of the factoring problem, we're given an integer and we wanna compute its prime factorization. Uh, this sort of solution always exists uh, by the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. And uh, this is sort of common to all these problems that sort of the, the fact that there is always a solution, their so-called totality, the thing that makes them total, uh, corresponds to some mathematical theorem. Um, and we can sort of state this like it's almost just as a matter of fact that if it's total, by definition, this quote unquote theorem must be true that for all instances x, there exists a solution y to the problem of x. Um, and uh, so to give like a more explicit example on like how we actually go about studying these things, what are the interesting questions, uh, we're going to focus on for now like the initial motivation for sort of studying this area, uh, which was in, in that pioneering paper by Papadimitri I talked about. Uh, where the goal was to sort of mainly to understand this problem of computing a mixed Nash equilibria in games. Uh, so if you don't know what that is, uh, it, we're not going to go into defining it. It's some concept of like a, uh, an ideal solution state of a game. And it was at the time we had sort of no complexity theory offered us no tools to sort of understand the complexity of this problem. Like it didn't seem to be NP hard, uh, but we also didn't have an algorithm and a lot of people thought maybe there wasn't any. And so what, uh, what he sort of looked at are these uh, three, maybe at first seemingly unrelated problems. Uh, the top two, if you know something about Nash equilibrium, might, you might see that they're related. But the first problem is you're given a description of a game and you want to find its Nash equilibrium. The second one is you're given uh, some description of a continuous function from the simplex to itself and you want to find a fixed point. And the third, maybe less natural problem is you're given some implicitly defined directed graph. Uh, I won't say exactly what this means because it's not so important, uh, but some graph and you're given a specified vertex which has the property that its in degree and its out degree are mismatched from each other. And the goal is to find another vertex which has the same property. And so what's true about all these problems? They're all total search problems. And the reason uh, is these three theorems which guarantee the existence of a solution in each case. So uh, for Nash equilibrium, it's Nash's theorem that every game has an equilibrium. Brouwer's fixed point theorem uh, gives us that these types of functions have fixed points. And uh, this is Euler's degree sum lemma tells us that this other problem uh, always has a solution. I think that Euler gets, gets such a big name. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Euler's two plus two. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but it is, yeah. Um, so what Papa Dimitri showed, uh, and well, one of the important errors was showed also uh, was later by Daskalakis, Goldberg, and Papa Dimitri is that these three problems are all actually polynomial time equivalent. So uh, what that means is that like given an instance to any one of these problems, I can translate it efficiently to another problem. Sorry, where am I? Uh, to one of the other problems. And if I find a solution there, I can map it back to here. Uh, so in the complexity world, this is just a nice result that tells us that this sort of 
uh, complexity class defined by these problems uh, it sort of captures really the complexity of each of them. Like the Nash equilibrium problem is really a, a equivalent to this sort of more basic problem about directed graphs. Um, and so that tells us something like in the complexity landscape, but sort of less formally, we might imagine that this is telling us really that these three theorems have sort of the same degree of constructivity. Like if I was able to prove any one of these constructively and supply you an example of the thing that is proved to exist, uh, there would be some sort of constructive, efficient way to translate that to the thing guaranteed to exist by any of the other theorems. Um, and so this is sort of the, the basic thesis of this paper and like the underlying theme behind this field of total search problems is that if we want to understand the total search problems and their sort of structure under, you know, which one reduces to which, which one is harder as a problem than another, this sort of arrangement of problems is equivalent in some informal sense to the arrangement of existence theorems according to which one is stronger than another, which one is a special case of another. Um, and so there's sort of, there's two ways you could look at this. Uh, the original motivation in this paper I'm describing uh, was that we just wanted to understand the total search problem. So we wanted to know, can we compute the Nash equilibrium efficiently? Um, and sort of this correspondence then is sort of telling us that if we want to answer these purely like complexity theoretic questions, it's going to help us to sort of think logically about what these existence theorems are saying and how can we understand if one existence theorem is sort of able to prove another one. So that's maybe an informal direction, but somehow thinking about that helps us solve this. And on the other side of the coin, if our motivation is just to be able to understand what it means to be a constructive proof, we can use this as our actual concrete way to answer that question. Um, and so there, there's sort of a parallel field, which I won't uh, get into in detail, called bounded arithmetic, which sort of has that dual perspective. They started by trying to understand this question and sort of converged to looking at these same problems uh, around the same time. So this is work by like Steve Cook and Sam Buss sort of did a lot of the foundational stuff in there that's called bounded arithmetic. Uh, so suffice it to say that this sort of connection is what the interesting sort of part of this field is about. And it sort of was arrived at in each direction, each one wanting to answer one question and finding out that they'll have to look at the other one. I'll just add that. Yeah. This, this thing is really old. This connection, you know, existed even before holy time. So proof theory in general is all about, uh, well, a lot of it is about trying to understand, you know, the relative strength of various statements, especially if this is like in reverse mathematics, the whole area of starting with the theorem that can. Yeah. So, yeah, it goes back, I guess, to like Brower and people like that you were saying earlier, who like to like intuitionist logic and things like that. Trying to look at similar questions. Um, is it, that's where you're. Yeah, okay. to to yeah. So, so cool. So that's what this sort of field of total search problems is about. Um, and as I hinted to, like, it, it's more than just this abstract curiosity about what it means to constructively prove things. Uh, this framework is really, for a lot of problems, the only way that we know how to characterize the complexity of sort of some weird computational problems that seem important. Uh, and. Uh, specifically, these, this is the case for a lot of problems that seem sort of between P and NP hard. We don't have an algorithm, but we also think that they're sort of too specific or structured to be uh, NP hard. Um, and so a couple of other examples, uh, we saw integer factorization and Nash equilibrium. Uh, there's also problems related to finding local optima in stochastic gradient descent and other dynamics, uh, various problems in topology, combinatorics, and game theory uh, sort of fall naturally into this category, and this framework lets us characterize their complexity. So uh, in this work, what we're going to show is a connection between total search problems and another area. Um, so specifically, we're going to look at some connections between total search problems related to the pigeonhole principle and uh, some fundamental problems in derandomization and circuit complexity. So the uh, basic sort of principle we're going to be considering, I mean, I'm sure many of you have heard of the pigeonhole principle, uh, but we're looking at a, a particular formulation of it, which we might call the dual pigeonhole principle. People in logic call it this sometimes. Uh, this is where you have a function that takes a smaller set into a bigger one, and you know, and the principle tells you that you have to miss some element of the codomain. So in the sort of standard version, maybe the set just grows by one element. And in that case, you know, we know there's some y in the codomain that nothing maps to. And in particular, uh, there may be exactly one. Uh, right, because if it just grows by one, we can map to everything else. Um, and a sort of the weaker pigeonhole principle asserts the same thing when the map stretches to a much larger set, right? Um, so in this case, we're doing it when it grows by a factor of two, at least. 
And again, the principle just tells us that the same type of thing exists. But the difference here is that like a random choice of an element from the codomain will now be a solution uh, with actually pretty good probability, like at least a half in this case. Yeah. Why is it for every x in s minus zero or in the bottom one? Oh, that was that was not supposed to be there. Sorry. That was from a previous <laughs> iteration of this slide. Yeah, ignore that. Sorry. Um, yeah, that should just say an s. Um, sorry, that should say an s cross zero one. No, that's no, this should say s cross zero one and that should say s. Yes. Um, just for there exists something here that nobody maps to. That's that's the image you should have. Uh, and the point is that in this week one, uh, a random choice is actually a good solution. Uh, so associated with this uh, sort of principle, we can look at like the natural search problem, right? Where we're just actually given one of these functions and we're supposed to supply the thing that it told us exists, that the Pichonel principle told us exists. So the way we'll model that is we have some circle, sorry, circuit uh, that takes n bits and it maps it to more bits, right? Um, so in particular, this uh, domain of all strings of this length is at least uh, half as big as, is at most half as big as that. Um, and the goal is to just find something outside the range of this circuit. Um, so that's one problem that we're going to look at here. Just to be clear, the input to the search problem is the circuit. Yes, yes. Yeah, that wasn't, it's not the input to the, it, this, the description of this Boolean circuit is the input to the problem. Um, and so, what we're going to study is this problem and sort of a natural cousin of it, or we can think of it as a weakening of it, um, where, you know, if I cover up this, that was the problem we just had, and we want to find something outside its range. Another problem is we're given two circuits, one of them that shrinks a domain to a smaller size, and the second one maps that smaller domain back up to the original. And now, like, a special case of this original principle tells us that this function can't be the identity, right? A way you can think of this is, like, you know, there's no way to compress a string and recover what it originally was. Um, and so we're gonna call this the lossy code problem. Um, and so we'll get into you know, specific things that are interesting about these problems later, but like the basic things we can observe is in both cases, a randomly sampled solution is correct with high probability. Uh, but the difference is for the range avoidance problem, checking a particular solution is not necessarily efficient. It might be like an NP hard problem, right? Because uh, you know, I, I have a certain why I think it's solution, but I really have to test for all possible pre-images uh, if they map to it. On the other hand, for lossy code, uh, it can be checked efficiently for correctness, like in polynomial time. Um, so uh, just to put a little picture, you might have heard these terms, TFNP, whatever. Um, the way that all these problems lie is, you know, we might have this large class of just all the bounded total search problems. What I mean by that is just a total search problem where we have some guarantee that the solutions are not too much longer than the instances, just longer as strings. A subset of that, well, a small subset of that, which is the most widely studied subset is TFNP, where we can check the solutions efficiently. That's like the lossy code problem. Uh, and then sort of in between, we have this larger class, which is called TF sigma two, uh, which is where the solutions are checkable in NP. So that's where this range avoidance problem lies. Um, this picture is not so important to remember all these names, uh, but this is the sort of picture of these broader classes these problems lie in. Uh, and so the results we'll, we'll talk about today are twofold. So the first set of results we'll see are about this range avoidance problem. And what we'll show is that this problem sort of naturally captures the probabilistic method of construction in a, in a certain formal sense. Uh, and that there is an important explicit construction problem, which is sort of complete for this class of problem. It's, it's equally hard as the range avoidance problem. And from that, we'll get some uh, interesting conclusions uh, uh, and new results in circuit complexity. Um, and uh, in the second half, we're going to talk about the lossy code problem, which is like sort of a special case of this one, a weaker problem. And we're going to show that this problem can be solved efficiently, assuming certain time space trade offs. I won't define what those are yet, uh, but there are certain lower bound assumption. And so for this problem, we're going to have, uh, we're going to prove that, like, assuming a certain lower bound, we can actually get an efficient algorithm for this. Um, and so this falls into a general category of uh, theorems called like hardness randomness connections. Um, <laughs> which I won't define at this point, but we'll say that this is sort of a special hardness randomness connection for this problem that we don't know uh, to exist for like other problems that can be solved with randomness. Yeah. So the, the picture with the complexity classes, is that it, it doesn't take into account things where you know, a random solution is correct or not. So there's no classes for that type of... No, so for this property that a random solution is correct or not, it, it's almost, it, it really pertains to the specific problem. And like something, it happens to be that the pigeonhole principle tells us this. I don't know if there's an interesting 
sort of structural complexity class you could define of things that have that property without needing a promise? Well, I guess all total problems are a problem. So, okay, uh, yes, in this picture, we're not taking that into account. That's the answer. Yeah, it doesn't matter the definition. It's true, it doesn't have a name, does it? I don't think it has a name, yeah. Yeah, I guess you could, yeah, say just that there's abundance of witnesses, uh, abundance of solutions. So yes, we don't have a name for that, and this picture does not take that into account. This is just about how hard it is to check the solution. It's not different than defining what you define, right? You define mm -hmm. something as problems that uh, there exists a solution for. Yeah, you're right. You just say with high probability. Yeah, I guess the question is, yeah, what, how much do you need? I guess just one over poly. Yeah, yeah you, so you could set some threshold. Yeah, I think you could equally well define it. Yeah, uh, I guess it hasn't been defined. Uh, I mean, we just defined it. So it has as of now. Uh, but it's not, it doesn't occur, there's not a name for it. Um, so yeah, so we'll start with part one, which is on this range avoidance problem. Uh, and sort of the claim I'm making, and I'll prove specific theorems along these lines, is that this problem captures the complexity of making the probabilistic method constructive, right? So I'm sure many of you have seen, probably all of you, uh, the probabilistic method at play, right? And a lot of times in combinatorics, we want to show that some object exists. We use a counting argument. Um, examples are, you know, expander graphs, really good linear error correcting codes, MC graphs, et cetera. The, like the really easy way to show one of these exists is to just make some counting argument. Uh, and then it requires sort of a long line of like really difficult work to actually match that with like a good explicit example. Um, and uh, so to any such like non-constructive proof, we can associate a search problem, which we'll call the explicit construction problem which is where we're just given as input just the size of the object, and we're supposed to output an example of one of those objects. So what I mean is like, let's say for expander graphs, we prove that you know, most n-vertex graphs are pretty good expanders. So then I give you the problem, given, me, given the length of the object, show me an expander on n vertices, right? And I'm writing this as like unary for the point to be that we want it to be efficient as a function of the size of the object. Um, does that make sense? So, um, yeah, again, if we have a proof that these objects exist, that just by definition, it means this is a total search problem. Uh, and so what we'll show is that for a lot of well-studied uh, examples of this phenomenon, the explicit construction problem will, uh, in very many cases, reduce to the range avoidance problem. Um, so the, the proofs of this are, are pretty direct. So the first example we'll look at is an example of rigid matrices. Um, I won't really motivate why people are interested in these if you haven't seen them. But a uh, rigid matrix matrix over, uh, is a n by n matrix over some field. We call it RS rigid. Uh, if you can't reduce its rank below R, unless you have to change at least S of its entries. So they're sort of far from being low rank in Hamming distance. Um, and Valiant showed uh, that there are uh, matrices that like are omega n, omega n squared. So you, you have to change a constant fraction uh, of the entries in order to reduce to a sublinear rank. Uh, but like a major challenge in uh, complexity is like produce any example, even with much, much weaker parameters than this. So how do we sort of reduce the construction of these matrices to this problem? Well, it's quite simple. The idea is that um, we're going to consider, so the instance of this range avoidance problem is going to be this map from calling phi. And what it does is it takes uh, some, we can think of this like the low rank decomposition of some rank R matrix, right? Um, and some sparse matrix S, and it just, you know, multiplies LR together and adds S. And the idea is that if uh, some matrix was not rigid, it was not RS rigid, then that means that there would exist some pair of some low rank matrix, which can be decomposed in this way, such that if we multiply these together and add them to some sparse matrix, we get it back, right? So uh, the point is that if, you know, this rank and sparsity parameters are sufficiently small, uh, it's very easy to show that you can sort of encode these with less bits than what it takes to encode like an arbitrary matrix of the field. Right, so the idea is, I mean, these are skinny, so you can imagine how, you, how they take less bits to encode. And then this is sparse in a sparse string, like we can do a lot of tricks to encode sparse strings efficiently. Uh, so this is some bit extending map, right, uh, which is an instance of range avoidance, and it covers all the non-rigid uh, matrices. Uh, so the point is that if we could solve range avoidance for this, by definition, that would be the production of a rigid matrix. So this is just like the standard proof that yeah, it, rigid matrices exist. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So this is the standard proof that they exist. And that's the point actually for like all of these is really that range avoidance is just the very natural way to sort of formalize the probabilistic method. It's not typically these proofs don't require some complicated trick. They're really you look at the proof and you sort of realize that this is an instantiation of this specific version of the pigeonhole principle. 
Um, so the second important example we'll look at is the construction of hard truth tables. So uh, a truth table is a way to describe a Boolean function uh, on n variables. Uh, it's, uh, so we have some Boolean function on n variables. One way we can write it down is just list you know, its values on every input. And uh, it's well known, it was proven by Shannon, uh, that there's an n variable truth table which uh, can't be computed by any circuit that uses uh, less than basically two to the n gates, uh, this specific value. Uh, and like a really, arguably the central problem in complexity theory is to make this, you know, construct to prove this lower bound for some specific function. Um, and it's very easy to show that this problem, I mean, this, this fact is actually was known, just not specifically stated, but well known in complexity before this, uh, right? That um, we can reduce the construction of our truth tables to this problem. The idea again is the sort of input is some small circuit of some smaller size than this bound. Uh, and what feed does is just evaluates in all its inputs and, you know, prints out the truth table. And the idea is if, you know, S is sufficiently small, we can use less than two to the n bits to do this. So this is some bit extending map again, which covers all of the easy truth tables. And so uh, finding something outside its range is finding a hard truth table. Um, does, that, does that make sense? Yeah. So the idea is, you know, as I said before, you, you can reduce all these sorts of problems to this. Uh, typically, it, it's very straightforward. It's not a difficult thing to do, which sort of indicates that this range avoidance problem is really just like the natural, like broad, broadest family that you can place all of these problems into. Uh, yeah. Is it expanded for us? Um, I'm not sure, actually. I, I haven't looked at that one. Um, what did you ask? The expander graphs, finding an expander graph. I'm not sure why you wouldn't be able to. What? I'm not sure why you would not be. It seems like you would. I, I, I don't sure. Yeah, no, I mean, I, so I can't give you a good answer. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would very much imagine that you can, but I don't, but I don't know. Um, okay. Ask a question. Yeah. Our truth table should be hard also for empty circuits or for circuits with very crazy gates, right? Uh, no. So, no. So, this is if you want to do this for a larger class of circuits, you'll need to define the range avoidance problem for a similarly larger class of inputs, uh, right? Because for this to be a, a circuit, like that needs to be a, like if this had some NP Oracle gate in it, I couldn't actually evaluate it, <laughs> right? But yes, we could for any class of circuits or machines or whatever, we could define this problem. But like as this gets bigger, we're going to have to raise the sort of the allowable circuits here. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And thank you. So I'm just thinking about Sev's question. So like you could get a hard truth table. So you could get basically anything that would be in the output of the PRG, right? Output of a corresponding PRG. But the question is how hard it is to check the property of the object that you want to construct. If it's easy to check it, then the output of PRG would contain. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So a lot of these problems don't fall. If I'm understanding, yeah, a lot of these explicit construction problems, it's NP hard to check if they have the desired property. So a typical PRG wouldn't. Have. No, no. You're trying to find stuff at, at the map so that your object will be outside of it. So no, I guess that uh, one instance of what you just said is hard truth table. A hard truth table gives you a PRG. A PRG contains every explicit object that this property you can check. But expanders are hard to check. So. No, you have to check. You have to, it has to include all the non-expanding graphs. Yeah, the image, the image should include all the non-expanding graphs. But I think you, are you guys are saying different things. Like so, <laughs> no, because the, 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 the yes, for the expanders, it should be outside I, of the image. I, I have a different <laughs> argument in mind. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So does it does it answer? Okay. Perfect. It, it seems um, like in both of these, these examples, you are talking about. Proofs that basically show that almost everything is what yes. you're yeah. looking for, and yeah. then you have a short encoding for things that are not what you're asking exactly. for. But many times with a probabilistic method proofs, you don't need to, to have probability one to, to get what you want. You can have things that exist with a tiny probability, and this is enough to show that they exist. Yeah, so yeah, positive probability is enough to show that it exists. And I guess what you're talking about, those type of arguments, I guess, would not fall in this class. So. Yeah, when I say this captures the probabilistic method, I mean, that's a very bold claim. It captures uh, a very classic subset of the, the first moment, moment method. It's called the first moment method. Okay. But probably if, if, you, if you can show that with the fractions of probability, positive, but bounded away from zero, yeah. it's still fine, probably. But if it's it starts, but if it's like vanishing, zero, yeah. I mean, if it's, it goes to zero faster than pulling on or whatever, then you might be in trouble. 
Yeah, I imagine I imagine yeah. that's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of what? The class of problems that reduce the range of events. Yes. Uh, well, we can just give it a name, um, <laughs> which is called APEP. I guess I didn't define it here, but we can, we can. So we'll get another characterization soon. But yes, we could define this class to just be the things that reduce to this problem, and we'll see that uh, we can define it another way shortly. Um, by reducing to another problem. By reducing to another problem. <laughs> yeah. I can see that it's, yeah. a, see that it's a huge class of explicit construction. Yes. Problems, and just wondering if it has any other sort of characterization other than reductions. Um, I guess I'm not sure. Yeah, no. I, I, I think if reducibility is how we would define it. Um, but we'll see. Maybe I'll get back to that question when we see some more stuff. So, um, so yeah. I said this already, a uh, natural family of problems reduced to this. Uh, a natural question to ask is, is one of these problems like a complete explicit construction? Like, is there some hardest explicit construction? Um, and uh, sort of a uh, really natural candidate to look at is this hard truth table thing, because we already know that uh, it sort of has a special place in derandomization and complexity. So there are these theorems of Impagliazzo, uh, Degerson, Nissan, uh, which say that, so I haven't defined BPP, for those of you who don't know it, uh, Basically, uh, these results say that any problem, decision problem that can be solved efficiently with randomness, uh, we can reduce it to the construction of a hard truth table. So like the important takeaway is if there was an algorithm that could efficiently produce one example of a hard truth table, I mean, for each input length, um, then we could de-randomize like basically any uh, effective random procedure. Um, and so this, this means that, the, you know, this truth table construction problem, like it is sort of captures some class of problems. But this range avoidance problem appears to be harder than these BPP problems. So we can't just use that result. The reason being, if you remember, this range avoidance problem, yes, we can find a solution with randomness, but we can't actually check that it's right. Uh, that seems to require an NPR. Um, so, or it's an NPR problem, I'll just say that way, uh, to check if a particular solution is right. So what we will show is that, um, that yes, there's this, this natural problem is uh, equivalent to the range avoidance problem. Uh, so, uh, what this theorem is saying is that we, we already know that finding a hard truth table reduces to this uh, generic probabilistic argument, that this weak pigeonhole principle, or I'm sorry, range avoidance problem, uh, and that actually you can get a reduction in the other direction. Uh, the caveat being that you need an NP oracle for this reduction. Um, so uh, why is this interesting? Well, if you remember before, these, this range avoidance problem lies in this class sigma two, right? It's like there exists some solution such that for all possible pre-images, they don't map to it. So sort of the only upper bound we know is this uh, sigma two upper bound. Uh, and getting an NP Oracle algorithm for this problem or for the truth table construction problem would be like a major breakthrough uh, in complexity theory. It would imply like a breakthrough circuit lower bounds. It would also imply that BPP is in P to the NP, uh, which if you're into complexity theory is very cool. It doesn't have a practical implication about de-randomizing things, but uh, it's sort of a very structural important question. So. Uh, so that's why these NP Oracle things are like sort of non-trivial. Um, and we will see the proof of this later because uh, some tools we'll develop later will we'll make it easier to prove. So I won't show it to you now, but sort of the high level takeaway of this, if you'll indulge me, is that uh, the weak pigeonhole principle is in some sense equivalent to like a special case of this theorem, which is Shannon's theorem showing that uh, there's hard truth tables. So sort of in some sense, this generic type of probabilistic argument it has like a hardest instance. It has like a, there's some instance of the theorem, which is like almost in a sense, as general as the full one. Uh, so that's how I'd like to think of it philosophically. Um, but as I said before, like when we sort of look at uh, total search problems in this view, a lot of the time they end up telling us like new interesting things about uh, the actual like underlying problems we're studying. And, and in this case, like we do get that. So uh, as an easy corollary from this completeness result, we can, uh, obtain some new um, uh, result about circuit lower bounds. So for this slide, like if you don't know what this is, just don't read it specifically. E to the NP is some complexity class uh, that it's a big open problem to prove any circuit lower bounds for it. In particular, it's super linear, we don't know. Uh, and what this result tells us immediately is that uh, if this class has like a mildly exponential uh, circuit complexity, then it has like actually basically the maximum. So it's sort of, this means that this class is like robust with respect to its circuit complexity in some sense, um, uh, which is a cool thing that we don't really previously know how to prove about complexity classes. Um, and what is the point here? Well, the idea is 
this class having that circuit complexity is really equivalent to saying that there's an, uh, an efficient NP oracle construction of a hard truth table of that amount of hardness. So the idea is using this completeness result, producing uh, solving the range avoidance problem is equivalent to producing a hard truth table of like that mild hardness. Uh, but producing truth tables of like the super high end hardness is also an instance of the range avoidance problem. So like we can take that mild hardness, solve the generic range avoidance problem, and then produce something with like really a nice good amount of hardness. Um, so that's that's the point of this. We'll maybe you'll see some more specifics when we get to the proof of that theorem. Uh, but it's going to be better once we introduce the things in this section. So part two, uh, we're going to return back to this other problem I defined and show some connections to uh, time space trade offs, which I haven't said what they are yet, uh, but we'll learn. So if you remember, right, this is the other variant of the problem where you have some map that compresses down to a smaller number of bits and then decompresses it. And we want to find a string which does not recover from its compression. Um, and again, like, yeah, we've seen this a bunch of times. You can solve it with randomness. In this case, you can also check efficiently if you've got a solution. So what we're going to show now is that if we assume certain time space trade-offs, which I'll say what that means in a second, so a certain lower bound or a hardness assumption, uh, then we're actually going to get efficient algorithms for this problem. We're going to be able to produce those incompressible strings for these compression schemes. Um, and so what do I mean by a time space uh, trade-off? Uh, I'm referring to like this specific conjecture, which is very widely believed, um, which is that there's some problem that we can solve in a time t, um, but we cannot solve it in, sorry, t to the epsilon space, unless we're uh, willing to pay like a super linear increase in time, right? So uh, we believe actually much stronger things. Like we believe there's some things that are solvable in time t that you can't basically reduce the space at all. Right? This is sort of related to the P versus L problem. Um, and we're, this assumption is something weaker. We're saying maybe you can like, decrease the space of any algorithm below its much significantly below its time. But if you do that, you're going to have to go up like, at least to like, you know, by T to the 1.1 1 .1 time or something like that. So we, we, we strongly believe this, but we don't know how to prove it. And the model, when I say all this, the model is just, for example, one tape turn machines. Or uh, it, it applies to several different models, but we can think of it like that. Um, so uh, the other thing we need to introduce is that uh, before the way I described these problems, like in the range avoidance, we're given a circuit, and that's the input to the problem. For this lossy code problem, we're going to look at sort of a slightly weaker version, where these compression scheme, these maps C and D, are defined for all n by a pair of Turing machines. So what do I mean by that? I mean I have some specific pair of Turing machines, one of which takes strings and chops them down by a bit, and one of which takes a string and extends it by a bit. And the goal is to produce n bit strings that are not recovered from their encoding by this scheme, right? Does that make sense? So I'm just switching from uh, giving you these circuits as the input to the problem to like defining a problem by one com uniform compression scheme and asking you to produce their n bit incompressed strings. Does that, does that make sense? Okay. You're guaranteed uh, that, oh, they're polytime. Yeah, they're polytime, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what we're gonna show is that uh, one of these two statements is true. So uh, the first statement is that basically for any such compression scheme, I can efficiently find the things that it can't compress, uh, which I'm going to call this like we can witness the pigeonhole principle. I know that's vain because there's a various versions of the pigeonhole principle I define. For this context of the talk, by pigeonhole principle, I mean this specific one. When I say witnessing it for these maps, I mean like finding the string that they don't compress. So that's, yeah, for every pair of polynomial time Turing machines where one of them extends and one of them contracts, there's a polynomial time algorithm that constructs it's uh, pigeonhole principle witnesses. So either that is true, or for every large enough time bound, uh, we can take any arbitrary t time computation and we can simulate it in t to the epsilon space and t to the one plus epsilon time. So we can shrink down its space uh, with barely over any overhead in time. So this is the specific theorem that we'll prove right now. Is the second one really that unlikely for this uh, range of time? So, I mean, I guess I, I can't tell you other than that we don't, I can't tell you more concretely other than that we don't know either direct, either way, if it's true. Is it anything? Is it surprising? Uh, yes. So it's, uh, yes, it does. I mean, so uh, 
it would imply, for example, that uh, like exponential time is solvable in sub-exponential space, um, which we don't believe is true. Um, but like I would say it's also just you can think of it as like a natural extension. Uh, I don't know, that we conjecture this to hold for most problems that we think you can't compress their space uh, significantly. Uh, and then this is just a weaker assumption that just that you can't do it without increasing the time. I guess, all right, it's something we believe to be true. It's hard to sort of compare it to other conjectures, but I think it's a pretty natural conjecture that people have tried to prove things like this in restricted models or whatever. Um, and the point is that it's very different than other hardness assumptions that go into hardness randomness trade-offs. If you don't know what those are, that's fine. What is epsilon in your um, is the constant? No, you can take it to be an arbitrarily small constant. Yeah, so for large enough T and for every positive epsilon, that should be there. But epsilon is a constant, so yes. why, why does it imply that? Uh... Uh, by sub-exponential, I mean like intersection over epsilon of two to the epsilon n. That's what I would mean by sub-exponential. I guess you could also do intersection of you know, n to the epsilon. But, but does that make sense? Um, so yeah, just as backing up from all of that, uh, this is a some assumption. Uh, the way that we believe, the, the scenario that we believe in this theorem is that, you know, this is not possible and this is. Uh, but really this is like, if you just want to think of it more generally, this is saying that like each of these is some non-trivial algorithm or simulation. And this theorem is saying that like one of those two things exists. Either there's some non-trivial algorithm that can deterministically find these solutions or there's some non-trivial algorithm that can like compress the space of any computation. Uh, so in, a, in any case, there's, you know, something cool. That's how I like to think of it. Uh, maybe in the most pessimistic way. Um, great. So that's what we're going to prove. Uh, does that does that make sense? The statement of this to people. Um, so the way that we're going to prove this is. No. I just asked the question. Mm -hmm. so under the range avoidance problem, uh, you explained its importance. It's, uh, yeah. But it reduces to it. What's the importance of the loss of compression problem? Uh, so that's a good question. Uh, it's more complicated. It's less important. So I'll say that probably is the true answer. Uh, there are ways that you could explain how it's related to the other problem that are quite complicated and I maybe won't get into here. There are some problems that reduce to it. Um, basically, the way I would think of it is just a weaker version of the other problem that like, okay, let's try to solve this first or see what it would take to solve first. And hopefully those techniques apply to the other one. There is also a way to state this result in terms of the range avoidance problem. Again, it's more complicated and I won't get into it. Um, so I would think of it like that. Basically the range avoidance problem is what we really want to understand and solve better. This is like sort of a special case of it. Let's see if some tool works. That's a perfect answer. Yeah. Yeah. This range of avoidance picture in your head. So range yeah. avoidance is harder than the black box randomization. Yes. Harder. Is this thing compared to any of the standard problems in randomization? Um, it reduces to the standard black box PRG. It reduces to a standard. Yes. So it's in search BPP. You could call it like that. And this cap where the standard randomization reduced to this? No. Uh, that would be because it's in TFNP. Okay. Uh, that's unlikely to be something you could show. Uh, we don't know the answer there. Uh, so this is so you can think of this if you, if you want to fit this into the for people who aren't familiar with like de-randomization stuff, you can ignore um, this sidebar just so I don't want to confuse people. But if you want to fit into that picture, I would think of it as like a Nice little subclass within search BPP. Thank you very much. Yeah. I don't quite see that it's that it's a special case. I mean, I see that if if the inverse of the function was in holy time, then it's a special case, but you could have a different well by C and D. So what I mean by special case is that it reduces to it. So like if I give you an instance of this problem, if I could solve the range avoidance problem for this, then that solution would just automatically be a solution here. So that's what I mean by special case. Also, one more thing, maybe I'll get to this, but um, so like you could formulate a non non uniform yeah. version of the theorem, I think. Uh, yes, you could. What's the, but there are reasons why it would not be interesting. So yeah, I wasn't sure if it's the, the proof doesn't go through or something. Yeah, but so the proof does. So you're saying why couldn't we not? Yeah, do the non uniform version and then get a non uniform thing here. The thing is, if this is only interesting as an assumption, oh, it's, it's two to the n. Yes, because if we if we took the non-uniform version of this assumption, that's actually something stronger than a circuit lower bound. Um, so the traditional hardness randomness trade-offs would just be better, and you would rather apply them. Um, but if you could get 
not sure I understand that, but it is the issue that the, the time space is in the, mm -hmm. the end regime. Uh, no, it's that we want it to be uniform. Like our uh, the time space trade off assumption is uniform. So this is that there's some language solvable by an algorithm in time t, and it doesn't get any advice, right? It's just solving it. So uh, for that reason, we can't insert we we can't insert into advice into our simulation. Hey, maybe it'll make more sense for me to answer this after we do the proof, and then we'll see. So, okay. Yeah. I'm slightly confused about the the place in which these epsilons are. Yeah, yeah. I uh, oh, wait, I actually don't have my iPad up here. This is a copy of the slide. So um, so really, there are problems. There, so this should say, there is a problem, L, some language, solvable in time T, and some positive epsilon. Yes. Right? Uh, such that it cannot be solved in these bounds. Mm -hmm. but, Okay. Does that make sense? Some epsilon. For There's some positive epsilon for which this lower so bound. Works. Now I'm again then, not convinced that from your previous statement. About then the, showing the sub exponential thing. This then is the, the negation of that is to say that for any problem, any t times solvable problem, and every epsilon positive, we can solve it in this bound, right? That's just the negation of the other thing. Right, and so then by something exponential, I mean you can solve it in t to the epsilon for arbitrarily small epsilon. You take it to zero. Oh, are you saying that uh, like time two to the n can be solved in like uh, space two to the epsilon n for every epsilon without the time overhead? This is what you. No, so something something is still confusing me about yeah. this epsilon because if you are saying that this is for every epsilon, it seems like. The lower the space is, then also the lower the time. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good. So this is just a property of how the simulation uh, works. It, yeah, it, you think of this as just saying that you can do almost sublinear space in linear time simultaneously. Uh, it's yeah, it, it is confusing because normally we think of it as space time trade off. It's like you make the space smaller, you have to make the time even bigger. Uh, this is just saying that you can't make this time. And this, like the time overhead and the space overhead equally like shrink them at the same rate down to some epsilon, some t to the epsilon. Does that, does that make sense? I have a question. Yeah, what would the expected amount of space be for the t time computation? Um, do we have any idea so, of what the actual amount of space? So what we know is that if you have any t time computation, right? Like this is just trivially holds it uses at most t space, right? Because it can't get anywhere else. Um, and we believe that there's some problems uh, that require some inverse polynomial in that. Like, um, how strongly you believe that? I don't know. It's a, it's a conjecture, let's say. Um, I can't give you some specific bound. Like, I think, I mean, I think many people would conjecture that there are problems that require like linear, that are solvable in some amount of time and require like linear in that much space. Um, but generally, it's believed you can't shrink the space in general significantly below it. Um, even though it's open, whether you can do it like a logarithmic amount, that's like the log L versus P problem. Uh, so we don't know. The gap is, is quite big between what we know and, and uh, what we know basically nothing uh, in this context. But, uh, but yeah, that's, I guess, the answer. Does it sort of make sense to you? So, okay. <laughs> maybe when you see the proof, it'll make more sense, or maybe it'll make much less sense. I, I'm not sure. Um, so, so how are we going to prove this? So we're going to say, Assume this isn't true, then we get that. That's the way we're going to do it. Um, so we're assuming that there, this is for every pair of machines, there's an algorithm. So the negation is there's some pair of machines such that no algorithm can witness the pigeonhole principle for that specific pair of machines. So that's going to be our starting assumption. We're going to show how to simulate uh, space really efficiently. Infinitely many ends. For, for, yes, for infinitely many ends. Um, we can do it either way. Uh, let's say for all but fine, for all but finally many ends. Um, then don't worry about this distinction. Basically, yeah, um, there, there's some um, there's some machine that like no algorithm is able, let's say, more than finitely often to uh, produce the witnesses to the pigeonhole principle for that. So what we're going to think is that this pair of uh, functions is like a counterexample to the pigeonhole principle, right? In a sense that. Yes, the pigeonhole principle is true. Like nobody's doubting that, really. Um, but um, basically, if no efficient observer can actually find the thing that the pigeonhole principle is asserting to be true, then for all intents and purposes, you know, for the sake of computation, um, 
basically it violates the pigeonhole principle. No one's ever finding uh, where it fits, right? So if we're thinking of these, I guess, some compression scheme that can take any n bits and shrink it down to n minus one bits, uh, then really an algorithm can basically use that compression scheme and like in some sense never have to worry about it failing. Uh, insofar as we are assuming that there's no efficient way to find places that are in place. And so that's sort of the perspective that we're going to take on this. Uh, and so what is the setup? Here's epsilon. Um, so we're going to fix some positive epsilon. Think of it like really, really small, like the smallest epsilon bigger than zero. Um, and we're going to set some arbitrary, we're going to take some arbitrary machine, M, uh, that runs in time T. So really T should be like a T of N. It should have an input length. Uh, but hopefully this will make sense. We're just imagining it, it runs in some time t. We're going to take that as the parameter. I think it'll hopefully make sense when we start to run through the proof. Uh, so the idea is we have this simulation. It runs in time t, and like trivially, that means it uses t space. Uh, and what we're going to do is, you know, we have this counterexample to the pigeonhole principle, quote unquote, and we're going to sort of restrict it. We're going to look at its restriction to uh, input length uh, w, where w is t to the f. So a little assumption I'm sweeping under the rug here is that I said that these maps uh, expand and contract by one bit. Uh, I'm going to make a stronger assumption, which you can prove is without loss of generality, that they're actually like changing the number of bits by a ratio of two, right? So they take in some number of bits and they chop it in half. And then, you know, this one extends by a factor of two. And we're just going to look at, uh, so this C and D are defined for all N, but we're looking at the restriction to T to the epsilon, which we're calling like the word length, W. Or forget word length, we're just calling W. Um, and what we're going to do uh, is this construction that, you know, it, it has a significant history with this sort of problem. Um, if you've seen uh, G, the GGM generator, uh, it's quite similar. Um, but if you haven't, ignore that. Um, and so what we're going to do is we have this, you know, function D that takes W bits and splits it in two. Like a natural thing is, uh, you know, build a binary uh, tree out of it, like just for fun initially, we'll think of it. Uh, so it takes W bits, it, it splits them in two two, you know, copies. Um, and then we're just going to feed those again into this circuit. And we do that, you know, a bunch of times. We're going to do it k times. I haven't said what k is yet. Uh, and at the top, we're going to have two to the k leaps, right? Um, and so, like, I haven't told you, like, what the point of this picture is. It's just some picture that I can draw. Um, before I tell you what to do with it, we're just going to fix some actual parameters in our mind. So we're going to set the depth to be log of t so that the number of leaves is t. And so, like, what is something I could do with this tree? Uh, well, I could take some, you know, I'm going to call this a seed. I'm gonna, I could take some input and feed it through the bottom. And I could just sort of percolate it out all to all its leaves, right? So I feed it through this function. And then again, like for each layer, then I get a bunch of values, right? I get t values at the top. And what I'm going to imagine is that those t, basically, those t values at the top are going to be representation of some t bit memory of a machine, right? I'm trying to simulate this machine that has t bits of memory. I want to do it in much less space. Is it a TW? Yes, it is TW. Uh, so, but imagine like we're just going to be lazy and like treat each of these as a bit. So that's what we're going to do for the whole proof. So, yes, there's actually W bits at each of these points, but we're just going to, you know, always have it be either zero to the W or one to the W. So we're going to be a little bit, you know, lazy. We could get a little more done if we did that, but it won't matter. So there's these T sort of bits up there. And what we're going to think is that this Y that percolates through and realizes those is like uh, our sort of compressed virtual representation of that much larger memory, right? Um, and the point is that the seed, if, if, if I just store the seed, it's t to the epsilon bits. That's where our space bound is going to come. Um, and so, like, so, so this is this vague idea that we're going to sort of perform the simulation of this machine by sort of only storing the seed and only performing really operations on the seed. And we want them to like be reflected in this virtual memory that we can't actually spend the space to like write at. Um, and so how are we going to do that? We, we, there's three basic operations that we're going to need. So the first thing is we want to be able to sort of set all the memory cells to like some initial identical value, like zero. Uh, I'll call that initialization. Um, second thing we want is uh, efficient accessing so I can read a particular bit of the memory. And then the final thing is to be able to update a particular bit. And I want to do that in some each operation in some time, let's say t to the epsilon, as opposed to t. If that's true, then I can do every step of the algorithm in t to the epsilon. So my sort of overhead in time will be t to the epsilon. That's where we're going to get the t to the one plus epsilon overall time. And similarly, the space will have to be you know t to the epsilon at each point. So we'll start with the initialize operation. Uh, remember, I showed you this tree, and it only involved d, which was the decompressing, the extending map. Uh, but here we're going to use. Remember, we have this other compressing map c. 
So the idea is we're going to take, you know, we want to set all the leaves to zero. That's what initialization is. I'm going to take two copies of this alt zero string and I'm going to feed them through my compressor and I'm just going to call whatever I get x1. Um, and then I'm going to take two copies of x1, feed it through to get some x2. I do that again and again uh, until log t times, whatever the depth of this tree is. Um, and what I claim is that if at each point um, I'm never finding a witness to the pigeonhole principle, then I should have this property that if I were to feed x1 back through, through d, I should get back what I started with this, right? And similarly here and there. So if we sort of work this through inductively down the depth of the tree, the idea is that whatever I end up with, I can take that to be my seed, my state of the memory. And if I feed that back through, you know, at this layer, I should get that x2. At this layer, I should get all x1s. And at the top, I should get all zeros. Does that make sense? So it's like assuming I'm never witnessing the pigeonhole principle. So like, because we're sort of assuming these maps C and D are like a counterexample, like nobody can find where they fail. Um, so in particular, this simulator, it can't find where it fails. And so this works. That's the idea. Um, and so how much time does this take? Well, it's sort of, I do one operation for every depth of the tree. There's log t of them. And then it's whatever time it took to evaluate these C and D things, right? Which we assumed they run in polynomial time and the input length I'm evaluating them on is t to the epsilon, right? So overall, this is like t to the o of epsilon. Will there some connection between this epsilon and the running time of the algorithm that can't break the C versus t? Because you're running in time t to break it, right? That um, yes, so it's like the epsilon. Yeah, yeah. So it's basically if it could take omega, if it could take uh, this much time, it would be able to find like like. So I guess you're you're saying how much how hard do we have to assume it is to find the witness? Uh, it would be uh, t to the one plus this, but a little bit more for whatever the overhead and some things that we're ignoring. Would it be like t to the one over epsilon? Um, you're running in time t the whole. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Time. It would be, yeah, it would be. Right. T to the one over epsilon. You know, on an instance of size t to the, t to the epsilon. So yes. Yeah. You're right. Oh yes. Sorry. Yes. That's exactly true. Yeah. 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 It's because because the instances of size t to the epsilon. So we need like one over epsilon hardness. But then how can you take epsilon to be as small as you want? Epsilon. Because uh, we're assuming there's no polynomial time algorithm. Oh. Does that, that make sense? That was a good, good question. Um, yeah, so, so, so yeah, so that's, that's how we do this. And then uh, this is sort of going to indicate, I mean, it's a similar, pretty simple thing we do for all the other steps. So for the access one, this one is really easy. So we say, I mean, you know, I'm doing the simulation. At some point, I have this virtual compressed memory state Y. I want to access a bit. Well, you know, the leaves, remember, I'm thinking of like these as representing the bits of my virtual memory. Uh, each leaf is indexed by some path. Right, so if I want to, you know, figure out what's at that path, I just follow it. Right, I feed y through each of these d things, and I get to that leaf, and I find out what's there. Um, and so again, we're going to get the same speed of time bound on this. It's going to be like log t times t to the o of epsilon. Um, so we get the same thing. And the final thing is we want to do this update procedure. Right, so I want to I have some memory representing like the previous step, what the memory was, and I want to set a new position. And like, what properties does the set operation have? We want to the thing that we're setting. It should change the way we want it to. And then everything else should stay as it was before, right? These are like the two invariants we want. So the idea is, um, you know, say we want to set, this is our old memory, and we want to set this, the position indexed by this path to some new value S. Um, so the idea is I start by just feeding it through, like the same way I did when I was accessing. Uh, and that gets me whatever was there, but I'm also going to keep track at each point of like what the off branch value was at the sort of the direction that I didn't go. If that makes sense, right? Um, and then the update procedure is like it's very simple. Um, we just so we start by changing the value we want to change to its new value s, right? And then we just feed s and whatever the off branch was through the you know compression scheme to get uh, this value feed that through, feed that through, et cetera. And whatever our new value here is, that's our new value of the memory, right? And the idea is by the same sort of argument, if we never witness the pigeonhole principle, if I sort of take Y prime and feed it back through D to access new parts of the memory, uh, if I follow this path, then I get to S. And if I follow any other path to some other memory cell, eventually I branch off at this point, and this has the same value as it was before. So I'll get whatever the memory was the last time. Does that, does that make sense to everyone? 
I have a more high level yeah. question about this uh, dichotomy yeah, between the, the two things. Yeah. Um, so maybe can you go back to the slide with the actual statement? Yeah. Well, not, don't know if it's too many slides. <laughs> um, it's not too bad. There we go. Okay. So. Okay, so imagine that this is also quantifying over uh, epsilon. This should be fair, but for large enough TM for every positive epsilon. So what I'm trying to understand no. is the following thing. Why what you're showing is not the following. Why aren't you showing that if the first thing is not correct, then there exists some T, which I still can't find, that if I would try to simulate using this procedure, I would find a... Uh, I would find the counter, I would find like a pigeon or thing, but I still don't have this stick in my hand, so I can't. Oh, um, okay, let me. So not let, let me phrase like this. Let's say that the second. Let me rephrase this maybe in a way that would make more sense. Let's not quantify over the T, let's just fix T to be some well-defined value. In particular, two to the N would be a good value to fix it to. Why it's exponential, I'm not gonna explain it, that's fine. If you wanna think of it like N, think of t as fixed so this statement is not really quantifying over t it does happen to hold that that it, it, if, if you did it for any larger or slightly smaller value the proof would work but think of this as like some specific t like two to the n and we want to know whether a space-time trade-off holds for that value of t like whether there's some language that can you know be solved in t and not this or, or not but it could be that because of the same reason that most proof tables are hard, but I don't have my hands on any specific one, yeah. that any specific T you can constructively give me does have... Uh, oh, oh, I see what you mean. Okay, so the, the difference here is that if a machine exists with this property or whatever, right, like maybe the proof isn't constructive, but the Turing machines are indexed by like numbers. And so we think of them as if they exist, you know them, right? Which is a bit different than... So like these problems where it's the issue of explicit there's some input length and we're trying to like, for every input length, we're trying to construct a thing, right? Versus if we show that a machine exists with some property, that's just some fixed machine. And so it just, it just exists. I get that. You're right that it's maybe non-constructive in a different way, but it's that um, there are different levels of constructivity. The kind of being constructive I'm talking about is sort of you have sequences of objects and it's like for each point, you want to produce something efficient. Yeah, I, can, I see. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah. So it's like a machine is a, we can think of a machine as like a number, like 15, like everyone knows it. You don't have to construct it. It's there, you know, it's like a constant. That's what a machine is like. That makes sense because it has a final description. Um, so, so there we go. So we got basically, where were we? So yeah, a, a little recap. Um, we're trying to simulate this t, arbitrary t time machine using this sort of virtual memory data structure. And what we showed is that uh, it, if we sort of load this with this counterexample to the pigeonhole principle, uh, then the simulation is going to work at every point, assuming that like we're never able to actually find this witness to the pigeonhole principle. Um, and all the operations they ran in time, like the bounds were like t to the o of epsilon uh, per operation, so overall t to the one plus o of epsilon, and the space was that bound too. Um, and uh, I mean, the, the simple point is that like if we're thinking of taking epsilon to zero, those like o constants in the o don't matter. So like these are the actual bounds that we get. Right? Yeah. If you only want a sub exponential algorithm for the lossy code problem, you could get the space to polylog or. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, yes, depending on the specific like amount of overhead you would like assume is required, you could take it to be much smaller and then you would imply a sub exponential. Yes, algorithm for the pigeon principle. Um, so, so yeah, um, sort of the contrapositive, the, the way that we, I mean, it's equivalent, but this is maybe the way we like think of it more is that if uh, if the simulation fails, like if we assume a time-space trade-off, then we know that the simulation has to fail somewhere. That's the definition of the time-space trade-off that we couldn't have done this simulation so efficiently. Uh, and then this sort of failure of the simulation is providing us with a witness to the original principle. So it's like sort of the constructive proof. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry for the no. It's okay. Yeah. Questions. Um, yeah. I'm just that uh, we don't have Avi, so we need other. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what about the input for the simulation? The input. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so I didn't get into this. So we're thinking of the the, the parameters in which this actually works is that t is like uh, exponential, in which case the input 
Um, you can just write it down explicitly on the tape. It's so much smaller than I'm saying what, what if the simulation works for any input that I can constructively create and it fails for most inputs. I just don't have them constructively. Oh, no, that's, that's a very good question. Yeah. So that's maybe the actually more precise way to say it is that we have this simulation and like input by input, if it fails on that input, we witness the pigeonhole principle, right? So there's, in that case, you can. So didn't you? translate one problem of finding something that happens everywhere, but I don't have it constructive it to another problem. But yes, you can think of it like a reduction. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it's we're, we're saying that, you know, we have these two. Yeah, so we we have this thing that we know exists, but we can't find it, which is this uh, pigeonhole principle, the witness is a pigeonhole principle. Um, and we're sort of translating to this other problem, which is like, if you could prove this constructively, then you could also prove generically the pigeonhole principle constructively. And in the thing that you're saying specifically, so no, maybe I won't get into what I was about to say, but does that make sense? It's really a translation of, you know, proving one thing constructively uh, is as hard as proving another thing constructively, which is like what these sort of reductions in total search problems are about. Yes, um, so basically you have now this constructive version of this time space conjecture. Yes, but so you don't actually have to make the constructive assumption if you just assume it for a large enough time bound. That's where the time bound comes in. Uh, because if you assume it for a, a two to the n time bound, then if you're assuming that it works, that it fails on some input, then you could also just as fast you could find the input because uh, the number of inputs of a certain length is proportional to the time when the time is big enough. So I, I wanted to skirt around this detail, but we don't need to make some assumption about finding the particular input. We can just assume a lack of an algorithm and provided um, the time bound is large enough, uh, it doesn't cost that much to just brute force. If that makes sense. Basically the input space is small. That's why it means to have a large time bound. I'm still a little confused yeah. about where all you're using, you need the time bound to be two to the end. Yes. So it's basically, so to repeat your question, what he's said before is like, really we need to find, we can't just assume this simulation fails. We need to like know the input on which it fails. Right, and that's how we find an example to the pigeonhole principle. And uh, the idea is that if we want to, if we don't want to assume that we can find the input where it fails, we just want to assume that there's no simulation. Like that's what a time, the generic time space trade-off is. Then to get the connection between there is no algorithm that uses small space, and I can show you the inputs where any such algorithm fails, that connection only holds in the, uh, in the case where the time bound is large enough that enumerating all inputs of a given length is not expensive. So I think I'm finally happy. Yes. Because if I understand what you are saying correctly, then you yes. just turn the epsilon to one over epsilon. Yes, yeah. Because it means that you need to enumerate over all of the input space. Mm -hmm. So now the- well, No, no, but not, no, yeah. Over all of the input space to the algorithm that we're like simulating. The input yeah, space yeah. would be this, this and to the epsilon thing, so you need to- I guess the, yeah, uh, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. All right, cool. So are there, no, let me just remember what my, okay, yeah. Do, are there other questions about? So, so back to my question yeah, about the yeah. uniform okay. version of this. Oh, yes. So where, where that comes in is, you know, if we wanted to get an algorithm that just solves the lossy code problem where C and D are given to you as an input, um, this sort of simulation is no longer just a true simulation because we're trying to simulate some machine M in much less space. If these machines C and D, they just exist as Turing machines, then we can sort of load their description into M and just get a new machine that just uses them, right? This is like the thing that you had asked before about how do we actually find the machine? We think of like one fixed Turing machine as like some constant that you just have access to and you can talk about it. Does that? It seems like there should be some, there should be some, some ver something to say. In the I think probably there is. I don't. I don't know. I, when I tried to think of it that way, that's the issue I came to, and it was like, okay, yeah. So, so, so yes, I should check the time because what I was going to do now is prove. Oh, it's already twelve fifteen. I guess. What time does this end? Uh, so I would say twelve thirty would be a good time to end, but give or take. Okay. So, uh, I'll just go now and and prove this thing which I promised you I'd prove before. Um, which is that we can reduce the general range avoidance problem to the construction of a hard truth statement. Uh, yeah. Can I you with one question about that? Yeah, of course, yeah. You said that there were several problems reducing to lossy compression. Could you just name them? Um, yes. So, 
so all right, one way you can think of it is if MCSP or problems like this are in P, then uh, hard tree table construction reduces to it. So we can make these sort of conditional statements. Um, another weird one um, is that the construction of large primes reduces to it, but only when the circuits have a factoring oracles. Circuits C and D have a factoring oracle. Uh, this is a result sort of a Paris Wilkin Woods like from logic basically that implies this. Um, uh, oh, the last one, which I think is really interesting, but this is not published. This is something that uh, Ian Mertz and James Cook told me at CCC, is there, there is a, a reduction from, if you've heard of catalytic log space, uh, that class reduces to this problem. Uh, it's known that that class is in ZPP, but not P. And in particular, that class reduces to this lossy code problem. Thank you. Which I think is the most exam uh, interesting example of this, but this is a uh, some result that they had, and it, it's not published, so I can't point you to the time, but if you, if you do, you know, you'd ask one of them about it, yeah. Um, and they, it, 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 was known it was known that it was in ZPP, and, um, the, but they showed me this like pretty straightforward argument that actually reduces to this lossy code problem. Um, which, which, so that's one example of like a natural problem that's been studied that reduces to it. Uh, but there's not many. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a isolated, yeah, uh, problem in some respects. So yeah, so this is the thing I was going to prove to you. Uh, and the point is, uh, yeah, I'll prove it now after the last thing because it's basically the same. I mean, it uses just a special case of the same like technique we had before. Uh, so the idea is, remember back in this problem, we just have the extending map and we want to find something outside its range. Um, and we want to show that if we had an example of a hard enough truth table, we could use that to solve this problem. Um, and again, I'm going to make the same simplifying assumption that I'm like doubling the bit length. Um, it's, it's pretty easy to show that it's without loss of generality. So, what I'm going to do, we're, we're going to have the same picture. We're going to fix some K. We're going to make this tree. I already explained how it works. Uh, and the idea is like we sort of, if we were to draw a dot around this middle of it, like really, this is just another instance of the range avoidance problem. But now it takes, you know, before we went from n to two n bits, now this goes from n to two to the K times n bits, right? Um, and oh, I had a slide for that. Um, and we're going to call it D star, right? So I haven't told you what K is. We're going to set K to be some nice parameter sort of at the end to make everything work. Um, and like, we're going to make two sort of basic claims about this. First is that if I give you a solution to the range of wooden problem for this D star problem, then we can use that to find a solution uh, for the original D in time that's efficient in N and two to the K, where again, like I haven't set this parameter yet, uh, but it's efficient in that um, if we're allowed to use an NV or uh, so we're, for this case, like we're going to think of an MP oracle as just the ability to test, to find a pre-image of a point under this map D. Uh, and now like this is pretty much the same as like these initialize and whatever operations that we do on this tree. The idea is like, say that we have something that's outside the range of this larger map. We can sort of write all its bits out, like each of these that should really be like a block of N bits. And we just say, you know, we use our MP oracle to say, all right, is there a pre-image under that? If there is, then I'll like write down what the pre-image is there. I sort of pull all of these back. Uh, and then I do it again and again through down the layers of the tree. And if at some point I find that something has no pre-image, then that's, I solved the range avoidance problem. So I'm done. What are the uh, several pre-images? Um, if there's several, then uh, we can choose any of them arbitrarily. So, but they might not, like, it could be that there are several pre-images here, but then, no, okay. Yeah, so I would just think of it like, yeah, so we take these two, we try to find a pre-image. If there's any, choose arbitrarily one and like let's write it down here on this wire. Wait. Yeah. No, it could be that one of them works with something else, and one of them wouldn't have a pre-image for something else after. Yeah, but then you wouldn't find a pre-image at the next level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah then it just percolates down to the next. Like the point is that oh, it's enough to okay. Yeah. It's just enough. Like if you didn't find one, then you solve. If you said there's none, you solve the problem. If you find some, just write it down. And we write them down here. We pull them back through the next layer, and so on. And the point is, you know, yeah, if I ever find something with no pre-image, I've solved the problem on D. And it, I have to do that at some point, because if I can pull everything down to the bottom layer, then I found a pre-image for the string under this bigger D star, right? Um, and so that's our first claim. And the second claim is that uh, actually this map D star is sort of, its range is contained within the easy truth tables, the truth tables of low certain complexity. Uh, this is sort of, uh, if you've seen uh, the rasbrov rudik paper, or the GGM, the, the, really rasbrov rudik uses a similar construction. Uh, and this is sort of the property of this construction that they use. Uh, if you don't know what that is, it's fine. Uh, but uh, this is the important property of this construction, which is specifically that for any two to the K n-bit string, I'll call it F, you'll see why I call it this in a second. 
uh, in just, this is just a binary string of length two to the k times n. Remember, that's the output length of d star. If we consider that as like a truth table, uh, then uh, whenever it's in the range of d star, uh, it has pretty low circuit complexity. The specific bound is uh, the, whatever the number of gates of D uh, times the depth K. And uh, the idea here is, again, pretty simple. Like, okay, imagine I wrote down this truth table, this function at the top, and say it had a pre-image under this big thing. So then, like, what is a circuit? A circuit's really just some, like, concise data structure that lets me, like, access each bit of the truth table efficiently, right? And we saw exactly, like, how to do that before with this, like, access memory operation. The idea is I can construct a circuit which just hard codes X, and like given a particular input, uh, it just evaluates D like K times to get there, right? So in particular, this circuit, it's gonna hardwire X and hardwire like a chain of K copies of D in a row. Like at each point just says which direction to go um, after you've applied one of them. So the size is gonna be like K times D approximately. Does that make sense? For any string here that's in the range, it can be computed by a circuit which has about K times D circuit complexity. So, uh, so, wrap, so wrapping those together, we're saying that if I could find a sufficiently hard truth table, uh, that would be a solution for the D star range avoidance, and then I could use that to find one for D. Uh, and then we just set the parameters uh, in a certain way that makes it work. So re remember this, I guess I didn't say this before, but the hardness, or I said this much earlier, the, the amount of hardness we're assuming is like a truth table of length two to the N with hardness two to the epsilon N. So really, if we want to reparameterize that, that it's the length is some m, and we want it to have hardness m to the epsilon, right? Um, for any fixed epsilon. So the idea is, okay, fix some epsilon like that. We set k to be this value, like about one over epsilon log d. And then like these two properties hold. One is that our efficiency is polynomial in the size of the circuit. That should be a d, sorry about that. It should be d. Uh, so the, the reduction is efficient. And the other thing is that we set it so that this bound, which we said, this is circuit complexity bound holds for anything in the range of D star. Um, that's gonna be strictly smaller than two to the K and raised to the epsilon, which is the output length raised to the epsilon. So that means if we found a truth table of this length, which had that sufficient inverse sort of epsilon hardness, um, then it would be outside the range of D star. Then we could use an NPR goal to find something outside the range of D. Does that sort of make sense to people? So this is showing, yes, that this general range avoidance problem, uh, there's sort of a very special case of it, which is the specific map that covers the, um, the easy truth tables. And like, if I could really avoid that one uh, map, I could sort of use that to avoid any other. Um, so this is sort of the most general problem in that class. Uh, and that's, I think that's the end. Yeah, thank you for having me here. Um, and uh, yeah, that's my talk. <laughs> uh, that's a guy analyzing this uh, the circuit that we saw before. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's a model. Yeah, terrific. Um, so, yeah, anybody, you can go to lunch after and for the questions. And Oliver was here today, so if anybody wants to yeah, spend more time here and more. More details of this piece of that. Great, yeah, thanks.